and that values the first Morton Deutsch Conflict Resolution Award, the Norwegian Literary Prize, and Augsburg Golden Book of Peace, and, and so forth. And in 1987, the alternative Nobel Peace Prize. Um, so um, Dennis then got up and asked his colleagues to join him in congratulating uh, Johan Dalton, and we congratulate him too. And uh, we're so happy that he's here. As always, he will tell you a lot of very interesting things and then be entirely open for remarks, even remarks that disagree with him. So thank you so much for being here again, Yotkan, and can't wait to hear what you have to say. Thank you, my dear. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it is in the U.S. congressional record, so it must be true. <laughs> That's the conclusion from it all. If you have a look at the sheet in front of you, the sheet which is a kind of formidable sheet and almost illegible, then I'll guide you through it. And my uh, <coughs> purpose of the talk is that solutions are very close. It's almost dramatic. They're so close, they're just at hand-stretching distance. And they're also inside U.S. tradition. U.S. being the most problematic actor in the world by far, responsible for 243 major interventions since Jefferson started in 1805 in Tripoli, and the continuation in Tripoli was made by Obama last year. Now, having said that, I'll not go much into it, but the thing about this scheme are 15 conflicts of which I myself have, um, I would say, relatively deep <coughs> involvement in the sense that I have been talking with all the parties and I have been with teams working on possible solutions. So if you now, when Diane has distributed them, just have a look at it, you will see there are three columns. And the column to the left are the 15 conflicts. And the column to the right is U.S. policy. And the column in the middle is solution policy. So my task is to show that the solution policy is quite reasonable. It is what most of the world would like to see. If the U.S. wants to go further down in world reputation, choose the column to the right. If the U.S. wants to release the latent love for the U.S., even one case of the column to the left would be a good idea. So let's start with Syria as an example. Syria has a Sunni majority as an Alawite Shia minority that is exercising a dictatorship. In addition to that, there are Kurds, Jewish, Jews, and Christians. The minorities in Syria have one thing in common. They are extremely afraid of democracy. If democracy means majority rule, they expect nothing good from it. The point about the Shia dictatorship is the tolerance of the minorities. Now knowing that, you would expect the minorities to defend Assad's government and the opposition to be mainly Sunni. The opposition is supported by Saudi Arabia, Sunni, and Qatar. Qatar is very important and has gained its status as a kind of number one in the Arab world, above Egypt, intellectually, because of Al Jazeera. Now Al Jazeera, Channel 275, if you have Comcast, is still far above the three major U.S. channels, ABC, NBC, and CNN, each one supported by a major arms armament 
corporation. In other words, the three major channels in the U.S. are channels for which peace is bad news. Now, this is not balanced by democracy now, but it is balanced to a large extent by something else that people are not aware of. On the east coast of the U.S., there are more people watching Al Jazeera, Russia Today, BBC, France 24 Hours, and they're watching the three U.S. channels for foreign affairs. In other words, you can say that in the East Coast, on the East Coast, Europe and the Middle East are penetrating intellectually. But my own, since I'm often on those channels, problem about them is that they are short on solution. So what does the solution to Syria look like? It would have self-determination and federation as two basic considerations. As I said to Rich when we were walking here, if you had democracy in Switzerland, in the sense of majority rule, all Swiss would have been speaking German today. Now, 71% do. But you have a retro Romanian, Italian, and a strong French minority. And they have kept the percentages by a large constant. Why? Because it's a federation. You have democracy within each part. So what would the parts of Syria be? There would be a smaller Shia part. There would be a big, big Sunni part. There would be a Kurdish part. There would be a Christian and a Jewish part. These parts would not necessarily be territorially homogeneous. They could be archipelagos. They could be non-territorial. You could have non-territorial federalism, not only territorial. And you would have democracy within each. There would, of course, be an overarching, as in all federations, center. And as in all federations, they would by and large specialize on foreign policy, security policy, finance policy and communication policy. Those four are basic federal concerns. Now that's one formula. If one had that formula, one would avoid the most dangerous thing, a clear-cut Sun clear Sunni Syria. As the US has been working since March 2003 for democracy in Iraq, with 61% Shia in Iraq, that means a clear-cut Shia Iraq. Now, with a Shia Iraq and a Sunni Syria, bordering countries, with Iran supporting Shia, and Saudi Arabia and Qatar supporting Sunni, and mobilizing money for the jihad against the Assad regime, you have the guarantee for a major conflagration in the Middle East. The U.S. should know this. I think part of it, why the U.S. is advancing the so-called democracy, is sheer ignorance. Another part is arrogance, and a third part is stupidity. These three, ignorance, ignorance, arrogance, and stupidity, do not exclude each other. They could come together in the same person. There's no particular problem with that. But it is very sad to see a great country having such a poor leadership. So what does one do? One does not do sanctions. The U.S. sees the alternative to intervention, the way Obama sees it, as making sanctions bite. They will not bite. They will be partly deflected downwards. They will partly agonize the parts of the population even further. And they will stimulate even more warfare inside the country. Because if you have, there are very few cases where sanctions have worked. South America, South Africa is not one of them. It is often touted in the US as a triumph. It was not at all. I've had extensive talks with Mandela and with the Klerk about it. And they both say, 
they didn't bite at all. They stimulated economic independence. But they had some kind of little bit of moral impact. When young people from South Africa traveled abroad and discovered that people boycotted South African apples, that made an impression on them. But that moral impression was much stronger by stories about South African apartheid. It was not the apple story that got to people, but the real story. In other words, <coughs> sanctions is not what changed them. So what changed South Africa? That they themselves in the apartheid leadership understood that their theory was wrong. Assad has understood that long time ago, but he hasn't seen any alternative. In other words, what is missing here is a conflict resolution culture as a part of a peace culture. And we are to blame because we haven't done a good job. We haven't done a good job in changing the culture. We are to be blamed. I am to be blamed. Not enough good job. I've been working 60 years. It's quite evident that we haven't found a way of getting solutions to people. You see, when I talk due to Dennis Kucinich and other people, and I talk with U.S. congressmen, and I present things like this, for that I say that I talk not about that one, but I talk about some other conflict, could be Iran, <coughs> it could be Afghanistan, so let us say Afghanistan. And then I say, look, here are five points, and these five points, having talked with Taliban, like very few people have done, having talked with U.S. State Department, having talked with Pentagon people, having talked with Al-Qaeda people. Not so many people have talked with all these four, you see. They talk with themselves quite a lot, no doubt about that. And they have their own boys clubs confirming each other. When you do that, here are five points. And the congressmen say, why didn't CIA tell us this? And I say, of course, CIA, Central, yes, Agency, yes, Intelligence. I don't think you should expect this. Because they are selected not for intelligence, but for conformity. And they are divided among themselves, and they operate by committee. And it's not obvious that the committee is the best way of arriving at a solution. But that's not the basic point. The basic point the congressmen tell me is the following. Our voters are not interested in solution. They're interested in only one thing, victory. And then we will dictate the solution. Because we are in exceptional countries, so we know what is best for the country. And they, of course, say, are you sure your voters think that way? They have good arguments saying yes. Good arguments. The candidate who stands for this runs a fair chance of being elected. The candidate who spells out the solution does not run a fair chance. My conclusion? <laughs> the dwindling importance of the U.S. The U.S. being caught in its own trap. And that the solution comes from somewhere else, not from the U.S. Let me take Afghanistan as another example. What does the solution look like? What are the five points? They're very simple. They became clear already when trans had mediated in February 2001. Before the invasion of Afghanistan, 7 October 2001. And the five points are point one, coalition government that includes Taliban. It doesn't matter whether they call themselves a political party or whatnot. You see, you have to remember one thing, that when Islam says monotheism, that does not exclude the Jewish Yahweh and the Christian God, Buddha, only. It excludes any voice of authority except for Allah. That means the correct political behavior is that which is prescribed by Islam. You, that doesn't exclude democracy, provided you elect people 
that convey that correct interpretation of Islam. And what is the correct interpretation? <coughs> can be discussed. But the Taliban would not organize as a political party. Of all the 56 or 57 countries in the organization of the Islamic, of Islamic cooperation, OIC, Afghanistan is the country with the highest percentage of Muslims, 98, 91, 99. To reject those who express Islam in the Muslim way is not a good way of getting at a solution. So when I talk with Taliban, what do they say? They say three things. Point one, we are a Muslim country. We hate secularism. Our problem is not Christianity or Judaism. Nor is it secularism, we just hate it. We hate development assistance that is not blessed by Allah. We don't see water provided just by digging a well or whatever kind of method is used as watered. It has to be blessed by the correct forces. It has to come within the right spirit. Point two, we hate Kabul. We are a country of 25,000 villages with a very high level of autonomy. Eight nations, very different. Two of them are in the so-called Northern Alliance, the Tajiks and the Pashtuns. They are about 50%. And Kabul is at the border between the two. And the West is playing on that one. But they're using Kabul as the center of what they think is a unitary state. We are not a unitary state. If we should be seen as a federation, it would be a very loose federation. Now, when I was listening to the Taliban the first time, my conclusion was, the only country I know that is, the country I know that is most similar to Afghanistan is Switzerland. The absolute obvious place to look for it, if you want to find a model. A very loose federation, but the ultimate decision maker is not the canton. It's not the German, Swiss, French, Swiss, Ladino, Swiss, or Italian Swiss, but the village, the municipality. They have 5,000 of them. They have survived for seven, eight hundred years. Afghanistan has survived Alexander the Great, the Mongol invasions, three British invasions, one Soviet, and it's now surviving one so-called American led one. They draw the conclusion that we survive because of that structure. We are not going to abolish that structure by having a Kabul that foreigners can occupy and then arrest a couple of people and destroy some buildings and they have conquered Afghanistan. Never. Point three, we have been invaded a sufficient number of times. This is enough. This is the war to end invasions. Now, the Western fascination with uh, Afghanistan, of course, come from that famous Tory politician geographer in 1904, and his doctrine about Afghanistan as the key, or Central Asia, as the key to dominating the world. Now, Imagine now that you look some 10 years into the time, I think the Taliban vision will be realized. But the Taliban will probably have to understand one thing, that it comes with neutrality, foreign bases out, no lasting commitment to any other country, neutrality, non-alignment, and good relations to all the neighbors. It has eight Islamic neighbors, if you put those nine together, it would be a very, very important Central Asian Confederation, Central Asian Community. Who are working in that direction? Turkey, to some extent Russia, Pakistan, Iran, not India, and China. Now, these are all important neighbors. And what I'm trying to say is that the U.S. with its policy has come up with something much more important than losing and made themselves irrelevant. 
Now, SCAR, which is the new name for ICAR, has a center, an important center. I could imagine nothing better than organizing a conference between top U.S. politicians and Taliban people. But a couple of others to be brought in. <coughs> Some Al-Qaeda close people. You see, Al-Qaeda doesn't come with a membership card, nor does Taliban. But if they themselves say, we can explain what it is about, they can do it. So I've taken two of the 15 conflicts. Let me now not go one by one, but say, what are the underlying ideas here? And I have um, 19 copies or 20 copies or something of the kind, but this is spelled out. So I just made them available. Diane, if you can just later on, put them on the table or put them on the table. So those who would like to read it in detail will have it here. <coughs> How do you get at good solutions? At one, you have to find out what the conflict is about. <coughs> the conflict in Syria is not about dictatorship versus democracy. It's two dictatorships against each other. The conflict in Syria cannot be understood without taking the context of Syria into consideration. There are many conflicts in Syria at the same time. Never reduce a conflict to two parties alone. There are always many parties. So then do, when you have identified the parties, that talk with all. And you ask them, what does the Syria look like where you would like to live? Nobody wants the killing Assad government Syria. Nobody wants it. But as long as nobody, including Kofi Annan, has come up with any alternative. The violence is going to continue. <coughs> there will probably be a jihad organized by Saudi Arabia, Arabia and Qatar. And the invasion will probably also partly be from Sunni Turkey. Uh, they can then do the same as they have done in Libya. Impose a rebel regime in the name of democracy. In Libya, there are seven major fault lines <coughs> that are never considered, or almost never considered, by commentators. And those fault lines are now working themselves out. There is no solution in sight. Because somebody has decided that it was Benghazi against Tripoli. It was Gaddafi against the Benghazi. Now the Benghazi clan, the Sanusi clan, is the clan from which the king came. That was deposed by the Gaddafi clan, from which Gaddafi came. It was deposed in September 1969. So you have old things there, but that is only one of the seven portraits. The other six are very strong, equally strong. In other words, to analyze a conflict is to be sensitive to fault lines. Sensitivity to it. And extreme skepticism about any idea that this is a two-party conflict. The two-party, unfortunately, is a part of United States deep culture. And it comes from fundamentalist Christianity. Fundamentalist Christianity with the devil and Satan organized against each other. And you know, the first conspiracy in history was the archangel Lucifer coming down, being expelled for having rebelled against God, and then coming down as Satan, finding his abode in hell, being deprived of his excessive beauty, handsomeness, and making an alliance with the serpent, and later on with the weak woman. And it was about apples. So you have Satan, serpent, and women. And even that man was persuaded, and the rest we know. The rest, as they say, is history. 
<laughs> and the women are supposed to bear their children with pain, and the man has to work with sweat on his brow and painfully. Like deans of uh, schools and professors and things of that kind, you know, with pain, of course. Now, having said that, I'm just saying that we are also ruled by that deep culture, and any mediator would have to pay attention to it. So I said, identify the conflict, then you look at the legitimacy of the goals. Is it legitimate for the minorities in Syria to be concerned with what would happen under a Sunni dictatorship? It certainly is. Where is their guarantee? No guarantee. What I find in the West is jubilation at the word democracy, an unreflected jubilation. I myself a part of it, but I have a couple of buts, but, 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 but. Like everything, it is yin yang, and may have its shadowy side. Human rights, they enter, but people's rights also enter. In other words, collective human rights. And here you come to a major fallacy of U.S. thinking. And you see it very clearly in the U.S. rejection of class warfare. Instead of class warfare, there's individual success or failure. And the society being run according to the correct lines before Obama destroyed it, which is very difficult to see that he changed it very much, but leaving that aside, when the lines are as they should be, those who deserve success will get it, and those who deserve failure will get it. And the tapering with that is to taper with the mechanism of sorting individuals. And the society is a sorting machine for individuals. Now, this doesn't work. It simply doesn't work. There are collective actors in the world. The United States of America was up against one. And 147 years ago, 9th of April, General Lee capitulated to General Grant. My wife and I are just back from Appomattox, since we are both fascinated with that story. And what was Grant's instruction was not to accept any capitulation by CSA. Most Americans don't even know what CSA is, Confederate States of America, as opposed to USA. Because for Lee to sign a declaration that I hereby in the name of CSA capitulate would be to recognize CSA. So what was accepted was the capitulation by all the soldiers in a circle 20 miles around the courthouse of Appomattox. Now, instead of having a collective actor, you have a band of soldiers in a geographically randomly defined territory. In other words, you deny them collective identity. Whereupon Lee capitulated and said that means mainly the Army of North Virginia. So the Army of North Virginia capitulated. And the last capitulation was in November 1865. That was the cruiser Shenandoah, which capitulated in Liverpool, England. And before that, you had one of the 17 Confederate states after the other capitulated. Eventually, because here you have a tendency not to recognize collective actors, which is why what happens in Afghanistan is never called resistance. It's called insurgency and rebels or terrorism. Now, this again is a kind of thing you have to be willing to recognize the collective actor. Sooner or later, the US had to recognize North Vietnam and sitting down negotiating. They would do that in Afghanistan too. They would do it in Iraq. It will not be with Maliki. It will be with others. May take some time before they do it in Syria and in Iran, but sooner or later they will do it. Next point, 
when you have that identified the actors and looked at the legitimacy of their claims, it's the creativity in putting it together. I wonder what creativity actually is. Let's look at another one of these, just one. Let us simply look at the war on terrorism. What is it about? Well, we have an enormous amount of words about it. Charles Webel, who is lecturing at the University of California, Berkeley, has written interesting books about terrorism. He says that about the terrorism relative to state terrorism is about 1 to 99 in terms of people killed. So if we now define terrorism as killing civilians for political purposes, then the state terrorism would be worth focusing on. When I talk with people who are close to the people who did 9-11, what they say is, we've had enough. And our conclusion is that the only language the U.S. understands is violence. That's our conclusion. So we did it. Maybe it was not the wisest thing we could have done, but we did it. What did they want? So you talk with people in Al-Qaeda or close to Al-Qaeda, and you ask them, what do you want? What does the world look like where you would like to be? And I always get the same answer. Regardless of age and gender and which country and whatnot. And the answer is respect for Islam. <coughs> You're trampling on us. And the minimum respect for Islam is that you try to understand what we stand for. Now, if I should summarize as a non-Muslim, Islam in two words. I would say they stand for close togetherness and sharing. Now, togetherness means if you pray, very close together. So close that you cannot put men and women in the same room with that closeness. We have never had anything like that closeness in Christianity. In other words, closeness. The women pray and they are close together in another room. Sharing. Sharing is not by having a roof, a ceiling on what you can accumulate of wealth, but having a floor. The zakat. And of course, the fasting is uh, to remind you of what it is to have nothing to eat and nothing to drink. So, the fast is a part of it, of the zakat. And the other two of the others, the prayer and so on, the common prayer, is the togetherness. Now, togetherness and sharing might be the things that is most needed in the West right now. And it might be the reason why the mosques are filled up with people and the Christian churches are empty. Not everywhere, but many places. So what do we have instead? Right, we have competition. We have mobility. We have no ceiling, no floor. We have an inequality as never before rising inequality. And here Wilkinson and his colleague, epidemiologists and physicians from York University in England, have launched a new paradigm. A paradigm many of us have been advocating, but we haven't had their success in the book The Spirit Level. Saying that the malfunctions, the evils, the things we don't like, do not come from poverty come from inequality. And there have been all kinds of efforts to correlate it 
perpetuate poverty. The assumption being that with economic growth, they will all disappear. Not at all. The list of social ills has a lot of medical things in it. Obesity being one of them. And they're able to show that the more inegalitarian the society is, the more obesity. Among the rich and the poor and in the middle. Now, you can discuss the mechanisms, but I would like as a peace researcher to come up with two other arguments that have been my arguments for equality, or maybe rather equity, not quite the same. Thing. If you have an egalitarian society, it is much more easier for the parties to understand each other. There may be fault lines. But there is so much equality that can be used to build togetherness. And if you are convinced that you can have no peace without equity, and the formula for equity is very simple, mutual cooperation for mutual and equal benefit. Mutual and equal benefit being the shortest formula for peace, for one aspect of peace. The formula is Chinese, it's not Western. The Western formula for peace is democracy, human rights, rule of law, and economic growth. They are all four wrong, for reasons I can immediately elaborate. Or at least there are footnotes so heavy that they're almost impractical. Now, if you have an egalitarian society and you say we want peace in this society, but we need equality, it's much easier. If you have a basically inegalitarian society, it's difficult. Now, how do you get how do you get an egalitarian society? By lifting the bottom. If you try to tax the rich, when you try to make the rich poorer, they will defend themselves. It's not the wisest way to do it. The wisest way to do it is to lift the bottom. The welfare state in the Nordic countries was based on lifting the bottom. Yes, there was progressive taxation, but that was a minor factor. Lifting the bottom. And I remember as a young boy listening to our prime minister saying, you're not going to touch the rich very much. We are going to lift the poor. But if the rich cannot tolerate that the poor come up, we'll fight them. They have to tolerate that the poor can become your equal. China has that mechanism, the US does not have it. It's a major reason why China commands respect in the world right now. The 400 million that were lifted up from 1999-91 to 2004, when they started working on the next 400 million, commands respect. If you look at Mr. Romney's suggestion for the welfare state money, the little that remains, it's not very hopeful, and he'll probably be the next president. Last time I spoke, or one time, when I spoke here, I made some predictions about what Obama was going to do. They all came true, so I now launch a new prediction. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. I admit I may be wrong, I don't think so. He has Goldman Sachs on his side. That matters. He has Wall Street on his side. Democracy was abolished by Citizen United. Javier Corpus was abolished from New York All of that has happened very recently. So one can safely disregard U.S. as a democratic country. It's run by paid politicians. And the question is, who paid more? Watch Goldman Sachs. If something can be done about Goldman Sachs, it would be interesting. Maybe less gold. Maybe less Sachs. Maybe. <laughs> now, having said that, What does one do with the war on terrorism? I think it's very problematic, and I 
can take my own country, Norway, as an example. 22nd of July, a young Norwegian. Much better read, much better schooled, autodidact, much more intelligent than the average of Norwegians. I feel only disgust at what he did. But I don't want to reduce it. They had a stupid committee of psychiatrists who tried to declare him insane because they didn't understand him. When he talked about his image of the world, they saw it as a madman's talk. They didn't see it as another way of reading politics of today. And in my view, it's not the slightest more psychotic than listening to the U.S. State Department about Afghanistan or the Norwegian State Department about Afghanistan. It's all configured by the same thing. The threat that Islam constitutes to the West and instead of asking what could the West do peacefully to counter that one, they see it just as a threat, and a threat to be countered violently. Now he went one step further. He identified the traitors in Norway that were helping Islam. And they were the Prime Minister, the government, and the young people in the Prime Minister's party, among them my grandchild. He was hiding behind the stern on the other side of that boulder. He was standing killing her friends, killing her boyfriend, who was a very promising coming politician. She survived. He dies okay. It's a small country, and I have no reason for any love for him, but I just want to understand how he thinks. I want to understand it in order to be able to see what can be done about it. So my formula would, of course, be to strengthen the West by increasing togetherness and sharing. And that would be lifting the bottom dramatically in all countries, reducing the inequality also between countries. And the togetherness would probably be only possible with the new design of the economic game. Less competition, less competition, more cooperation. And I think the major people, if any profession should be blamed, would be the economists. And the major field to be changed would be economics. So my next book is called Peace Economics. We'll have a couple of books there. Here's the one that was published two weeks ago, Peace Mathematics. So I try to be active. <laughs> I have uh, defined retirement as being tired again and again and again. <laughs> For that reason, I don't believe in it. And research as searching again and again and again. But let me continue. Dialogue with terrorists, is that possible? I'll tell you my experience. If you manage to find one, and he would never say, I'm a terrorist. He would say, I understand them. And he would not tell you about how he did this and that. But he has a mindset. And basic to that mindset is that violence is the only thing the West will ever understand. He has given up on dialogue. Given up. So if you talk with him, can you have a dialogue with him? My problem has not been to enter into dialogue with him, but to find some way of stopping him from talking. He talks endlessly, 24 hours without breathing. I fall asleep. Why does he do that? Because nobody has ever asked him what he wants. Nobody has ever taken him seriously and asked him, what does the world look like where you would like to live? What does it mean, respect for Islam? What does that mean? And he'll tell you all kinds of anecdotes about the stupid way in which the West tries not to understand Islam. And they don't even know that, and they don't know this, they don't know that, and he has ten major points that usually come up. And that should be, at a lot elementary, should be known by everybody. And, uh, for instance, one of them just being, Islam excludes secularism. 
Christianity has the idea, give to Caesar that of Caesar, and to God that of God. And Washington Post had a big article on that this Sunday. That discourse doesn't exist in Islam. Take another point, Muhammad was a politician 10 years. Jesus never practiced. He was a preacher. Muhammad was also a preacher. But he had 10 years practice. Running the city-state of Medina. And what they did during that period was, of course, recorded by all the Muslims, and is a source of their way of looking at the world. So the good society is society as it was run by the Prophet, according to the more faithful. One source of insight. Well, one has to know these kind of things. Well, is that possible? Then you talk to the other side, you talk to the State Department. What does the world look like? terms of terrorism that you would like to see. And they say democracy all over and market forces, free markets all over. In other words, the classical end of history of Honda. I think they're revising it a little bit now. So when I ask democracy all over, that does apply to the whole world. You want referenda in the whole world population. You want a United Nations Parliament, democratically elected and things of that kind. No, 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 no. Democracy in all states. Now, one interesting thing here is sticking to the state system. There are 193 of them, members of the United Nations. They managed to stop number 194, Palestine, so far. They'll come. So, 193. And here comes my little tiding. They're all disappearing, with some very few exceptions. What's coming up are the regions. And the regions are getting stronger. The strong states, the biggest one, will survive. China, Russia, India, maybe United States. In 10 years' time, the United States will have found its place together with Canada and Mexico in the North American region. Canada is U.S. trade partner number one, Mexico is number three. U.S. is trade partner number one for Mexico and for Canada. The basic condition is fulfilled. Mutual trade in Latin America is increasing enormously. Now, if you look at that, the state gain is not the lasting gain. So it's a question of whether one can sort of liberate oneself from that. The global game is not there yet. The globalization that the West pursues, they pursue because the world is relatively anarchic. And they only pursue it as long as the UN is weak and doesn't have a parliament, for instance. The moment the UN had that, which could speak in the name of the peoples of the world, it would be more problematic. So what they want is, of course, private capital running the world in a globalizing world with the stock exchanges being the substitutes for foreign offices. And then running the world by putting other countries in debt bondage. Now, it doesn't work. The country in most debt bondage is the US. Number two is Spain. If you add the usual, let us say, four types of debt, household debt, now or five types, corporate debt, municipal debt, sub-state debt, provincial and state debt, the five types, Spain is number two. Where are the creditors? China, European Union, for the countries in the periphery of the European Union, the gypsy country. Gypsy, G for Greece, I for Italy, P for Portugal, S for Spain, I for Ireland. The gypsy, it sounds much better than pigs. <laughs> so, the gypsy countries. The creditor is Germany. Germany is playing a very stupid and very dangerous game. Nobody loves his creditor. There may be a sigh of relief the moment you get a loan, a credit. 
that side of relief disappears quickly. Germany has old reasons to be hated. They are now coming high. So when I say equality, equity, it's not only inside states, but between the states. Germany would do the world a favor, canceling the debts. Simply cancel it. They will only reap the most, let us say, disgusting harvest they could get from that. How about the U.S.? Well, the U.S. believes it has a method, which is to print money. And since they have the printing presses, that money will last as long as the U.S. dollar is the reserve currency of the world. The BRICS have now come up with an alternative, and that alternative is working its way. It will not last long. And the reason why it will not last long is the triple bubble in the U.S. economy. Too much printed money relative to the value of the economy, $14.3 trillion. In other words, the inflation. And the inflation is already there. My wife and I, when we come once a year, notice the difference more than many others. It's palpable. But I'm talking much more of an explosive difference, which probably will come later this year, in 2013. And you have, of course, the bubble between the finance economy and the real economy, between derivatives and the real economy. And you have the bubble between serving the debt and serving people. Very intractable problems. I think many of them sleep very badly at night. How do you solve that? You solve it by lifting the bottom up. You solve it by giving up the idea of being the World Federal Reserve. You solve it by illegitimizing derivatives. <coughs> All of that can be done. <coughs> totally possible, not very likely. If it is not done, down you go. And quickly so. Now, there are a couple of things to add to this and subtract from it, but I have indicated some of them. I will only speak a few minutes more. What I have said is that the solutions are at hand, and they're not that complicated. You'll find them in the sheet, and you'll find the policies to the right. I then have the hypothesis that the more the right-hand column is enacted, the more U.S. will go down and continue to go down. There is the opposite hypothesis. The U.S. doesn't have to enact all the 15 solutions. Only to show an inclination with one of them. And the world will be jubilant because of the enormous labor flow of the U.S. Pew Associates made a study of the Muslim attitude to the U.S. found 85% of Muslims loving the U.S. and 85% of Muslims hating U.S. foreign policy. There you go. <laughs> this read is about foreign policy. I could pick up one. I could pick up Japan. I could say about Japan, Latin America, Africa. If the U.S. had the courage to say to Latin America, we welcome CELAC. Consejo de Estados Latinoamericanos y Caribe. CELAC. The United States coming of Latin America and the Caribbean. We're doing the same as what we once did. We once did it, maybe starting in 1771, then coming up to 1776, 89, 1812. We welcome you. And we welcome your assurance that you want to cooperate with us on equal terms. Let's sit down and spell out what that means. What can you learn from us? What can we learn from you? You have interesting new economies coming. You are having international economy trading basic need satisfiers for basic need satisfiers. And you don't monetize it. You just say so and so much beef for so and so much oil, for so and so many doctors. 
and it runs between Argentine, Venezuela, and Cuba in innovation. Could that be interesting for us when we try lifting the bottom up? What can you learn from us? Japan, if you feel like joining the East Asian community, do so. We've had a look at the map. It seems to be where you belong. But let's continue having nice cooperation on equal terms. And maybe you could put in a sub couple of words for us in the ears of China. Maybe you could do so. Africa, if you want to make your union more effective, we welcome it. And we have cancelled all the plans for an Africa. We cancelled it. We just welcome it. But as a region, you would of course participate in interregional dialogue. And in that dialogue, you would be sensitive to our arguments, if you are sensitive to yours. And um, without any American knowing what I'm going to say now, we are fascinated by Sheikh Diob's vision for an economy of Africa. He was a Senegalese who made a doctorate thesis at Sorbonne that was rejected because he rejected Western economic thinking and based it on very, very thousands of years old African thinking. Let me stop by saying in this book, Peace Mathematics, I discovered a German author who had discovered <coughs> where mathematics started. It's in Africa. Somewhere close to the border of what today is known as Congo and Uganda, they found some bones. And on the bones were carved something that was identified as prime numbers. All the prime numbers were there. And the number of things that could be identified as equations, how old were the bones? 29,000 years. Now, that takes care of Babylon and Egypt and Greece and things of that kind. So this is the world we live in. And I think it would be easy, actually, for U.S. to regain its status. Thank you. Now I'm open to anything that might come to your mind. Please. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you so much for this illuminating speech. Um, it, uh, you focused on Syria in the beginning, and um, I'm from Turkey, and I'm interested in the region as a whole. Um, and um, a few days ago, uh, Prime Minister Erdogan went to uh, Ch China and made some uh, Notice that she says Erdogan, because the G is moot. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and um, he said that, actually he pointed to the um, cross-border attacks coming from Syria lately. Um, some of the, um, actually some of the people escaping from Syria to refugee camps in, um, in the border of Turkey uh, were shot by the Syrian uh, armed forces. And um, Erdogan said that Turkey sees this issue as an, um, uh, like Article 5. You know, Turkey can use Article 5 of the NATO uh, because this is like cross-border uh, attack. And um, also Turkey pointed that, um, you know, UN approval is needed uh, in the case of involving in Syria. Um, in addition to that, um, it seems that Turkey is on alert right now because the foreign minister is having like uh, top-level uh, conversations with um, you know, chief of the uh, intelligence uh, in Turkey and also uh, armed for a uh, chief of the armed forces. Especially this morning, there was so intensive talks. Uh, it seems that Turkey is getting prepared. Um, what do you think about the legitimacy of this NATO uh, Article Five in this situation? and uh, legitimacy of the uh, foreign intervention. If it happens, it seems that it's going to happen very soon. Um, um, so as a conflict resolver, like prospective conflict resolvers, uh, how should we analyze this issue? Because it's very um, hot debate and very uh, critical at this moment. Um, as you did like prospective um, uh, projections about uh, Obama, 
uh, I think you, you can have uh, very uh, on the point projections for Syria as well. How do you evaluate Turkey's foreign policy at this moment? My prediction is the same as yours, that the attack will come. That's what the West wants. And they attack Libya. They attack Libya because of Gaddafi's policies. And the people in Algeria suffered much, much more than the people in Libya ever did. But Algeria is entirely on the western side. Syria is not on the western side. And for that reason will be attacked. I think the Syrian military forces are wild, mad, demoralized, and are shooting in all directions. I sense a total lack of leadership. On the other hand, of course, when somebody from Syria escapes onto Turkish territory, they attempted to disregard the border. Now, when it comes to Erdogan, I don't quite know what to think. Maybe you can illuminate me. I attended to see him, and I still do, as an extremely gifted politician. To be able to maneuver Turkey in the direction of the overwhelming Muslim majority and away from military dictatorship, secular dictatorship, is a feat of global significance and demands total respect. At the same time, he's